So for those of us who do not know who you are, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name's Jeremiah Thacker. I do gig work. I I work uh, as a as a utility in A2 and a V2 in live broadcast sports, and I work as an uprigger in um, concert entertainment. I I have been lots of other things, but that's that's what I do nowadays. Um, it's pretty pretty enjoyable set of gigs, you know. It uh, makes the makes the time flow by when you're doing them, and feels uh, like the um, I like the flow state of working in that way, and the and the completion. You know, when you when you complete a gig, that gig is over. Uh, you can put it in the box and count it done. You don't have to think about it. Where are you from? I am from a teeny little town east of Jonesboro, uh, that is in the middle of a swamp and surrounded by cotton fields uh lived uh lived in the jonesboro area in many different towns my mom was a school teacher and moved around uh, graduated from nettleton high school way back in 1991 but i've been here for 30 years <laughs> how was your childhood growing up there i, I you know it was uh it was flat. <laughs> childhood my childhood was was flat out there and dusty. Uh you know, I had a I had a good time, you know, kicking around in the fields and uh learning to play pickup basketball on the asphalt. Uh you know, where 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 calling your own fouls is a sign of weakness. You know, <laughs> and uh you know, uh, had a had a good time out there. You know, I I uh, because I guess because of growing up there, the heat up here doesn't bother me. <laughs> when did you get introduced to music? Oh, uh, my mom got a degree in vocal performance and was a elementary school teacher, uh, elementary music teacher. Uh, and my uncle's Jim Dandy. Uh, from Black Oak, Arkansas, the town that I'm from, <laughs> which I didn't mention by name because I, because I, um, because I don't want to coattail, you know, I, I don't, I want to, want to be my own person and do my own thing. My uncle's awesome, uh, but, but I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to be here. I'm a gain popularity from what he's done, but, uh, but music's always been a huge part of my life. Uh, when, uh, when I was in maybe third grade, my uh, my uncle's band was uh, practiced in my grandparents' backyard where I lived, and uh, and a lot of the world doesn't know about Sean Lane. But when I was in third grade, Sean Lane was playing live in my grandparents' backyard, and um, for this reason, I've, I, I've kind of been unimpressed by other guitarists that maybe I should have been uh, in life because this guy uh, that sat and ate raw snickerdoodle do with dough with me and uh shot horse with me as one of the most shredding guitarists that has ever existed uh if you don't know about sean lane uh, you're welcome for hearing his name uh that, <laughs> that uh music's always been big uh central even in my life for those who do not know your uncle can you tell us more about him and um, the genre that he was in and his level of success? Oh, sure. Uh, the first band, I think, that he he and Ricky and a few other guys started uh, was called The Nobody Else, and they went to uh, New Orleans and uh, recorded, I think, either one or two albums. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, and then... Uh, got picked up by Stax, uh, a Motown label uh, from Memphis, and uh, changed the name to Black Oak, Arkansas. They had three gold albums, uh, Jim Dandy to the Rescue, y you've heard. But uh, but they they had a lot of good songs. They had the, the strongest rhythm section I've ever seen with uh, Pat Doherty and Tommy Aldridge and Ricky Reynolds on 12-string guitar. Uh, they had 
uh, two lead guitars and it was early, you know, it was kind of, they maybe weren't the first people ever to do that, but they were, they were early on in it. Uh, they had a lot of success. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I might be wrong again, but there was an article in Rolling Stone in 1976 where they pulled in some ridiculous number of dollars for concert admission. And, uh, I think it caused the band to break up when everybody found out how much the management was getting and they weren't. <laughs> so, you know, the, they, they reached the, the pinnacle of success. They played Royal Albert Hall. They, you know, played to crowds of 500,000 Daytona and the California jam. And, you know, they, they were big, big, big. <laughs> and Jim's still going. Uh, hooray, uncle Jim. Uh, he's the, he's the last, last one. Do you hope to follow in his footsteps? No, I do not. Uh, my ambitions are much smaller. I, you know, I, I want to play on Saturday night, but I want to play on Saturday night, maybe two, three hours away from home and, and come back home. I don't want to be on the road. They, they played something like 320 dates in a year that year. You know, that, <laughs> that, uh, they were the first band, as far as I know, to have two rigs. They, so that they, the setup crew would be setting up one rig while they were playing one show, and they would go and play on that rig while that one's tearing down and going and setting up. So they had two rigs that were leapfrogging in front of them to be able to play that many dates. Uh, they, I have no, I have no intention of playing three hundred twenty dates a year. <laughs> what are your intentions with music? Like, where do you see yourself? and your music career going? Uh, man, if I, if I make it to Saturday night and make gas money, I'm a huge success. That, by my books. Uh, I, what I love to do is win over a crowd. Uh, I love to get out there and, uh, and, and find, the, find the pulse of where everybody's at and get that feedback going between performer an audience that makes it, uh, I don't know, it makes it, makes it better somehow. Uh, and that's, I'm kind of a junkie for that. I want, I, I want to win over a crowd and be, um, be accepted by new people that, that haven't heard me before, don't know me before. Uh, I'm not trying to go someplace and people sing my song back at me, you know. <laughs> Separating yourself from your uncle, when did you first realize that you wanted to be a musician? When did you find that spark, that love for music, and it just made you say, man, I got to do this. I want to do this. I went to the little Baptist church right across the street from Grandma and Grandpa's house. You know, we were there every Sunday, and um, if you know Baptist churches, you know they like to sing. And, uh, and we sang loud and proud every Sunday. And uh, because my mom was a vocal performance major, uh, she would do a special uh, now and then. And, uh, and I love to watch mom do a special. She could stand your hair on end. She's the best vocalist I've ever heard. Um, and she brought me up one Sunday to, to perform with her. And I got to feel what it was to to do something in the crowd like it. And it was that moment that uh, standing on the, standing on the bottom step of the three steps of the stage at the Baptist church in Black Oak, Arkansas, that I decided I want to play music. Now I never wanted to play music in church because I couldn't reconcile making money off God. But, uh, but I, but I love church music. <laughs> so when did you make that transition to creating writing, creating, producing your own music. We're still working on producing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, always, uh, always, I would, I would create little, uh, before Weird Al Yankovic, you know, I was, I was creating little parodies, not as good as Weird Al. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, little, uh, use the melody of something else and whatever I happen to be thinking or just create a little ditty. I was maybe a, I was maybe 17 or 18 before I wrote lyrics for some 
cathartic event down that I wanted to be a song and be my song. Uh, I think maybe that's the answer. Maybe late teen, the, I started writing, and then uh, some friends of mine had a had a band and needed a singer. They had some they had some songs, and I overlaid some of my lyrics and melodies onto some songs they had, and we created the band Cheryl's Kitchen uh, because uh, our rhythm guitarist Drew Eldridge had the had the practice space for us, and his mom, bless her heart. Uh, fed us uh, in the best way imaginable. Uh, they so hospitable and helpful that we want to name the band Cheryl's Kitchen, uh, and uh, and we had a lot of fun, but it was short lived. Can you tell us about your adventures with Cheryl's Kitchen? It was really short lived. We uh, we played a battle of the bands and came in second. Uh, <laughs> We played a fraternity party. Came in first. <laughs> uh, we uh, we played another fraternity party. We uh, one of the guys uh, <laughs> one of the guys worked at Shoney's. Oh, this is horrifying. One of the guys worked at Shoney's, and the manager told us that he had a connection to the Mountain Inn and Mountain Home, and he was going to book us for July Fourth weekend, Saturday night, and we just needed to show up, and they were going to pay us thousand dollars to play. And so we went there. They never heard anything of the kind. <laughs> so Home Slice's manager just gaslighted him to, to find out how funny it would be for us five dudes to drive out to Mountain Home. I guess it was pretty funny. But that, that you know, that might not exactly have been the end of the band, but... <laughs> so... Tell us about after that, after the band, after the end of the band, what did you do after that? So did you go on to try to pursue a solo career? Well, I, uh, I bounced around for a couple of years, uh, moved to Bahalia, Mississippi, uh, visited my uncle who lived in Memphis, and uh, then moved to Fayetteville in uh, 95. And then... Uh, when I got to Fayetteville in '95, um, I was I was supposed to start a band with uh, with my buddy Jason Dawson, who uh, who I had played with since before Cheryl's Kitchen and written several songs with, but we had never managed to uh, get more than just the two of us together and weren't satisfied. You know, we <laughs> we had a house where we uh, uh, where we paid our rent by throwing keg parties. <laughs> <laughs> and and be in the entertainment but we didn't have uh, any real gigs ever so uh but but jason and i moved to fayetteville to start a band and uh and a guy named uh, uh named shane shane helmer uh met up with us and the three of us were gonna gonna play a gonna play a gig and then then it fell through and jason got busy with other stuff and uh and shane and i started trying to have a band and I rented a I condensed a couple of years into a sentence and uh and I rented a studio from Daniil Campbell over here on Center Street the Quonset Hut uh I think it's the last studio that's still uh Quinn Landrum is with uh Rocket Coma is practicing in now until the end of the month it's about to about to go away but thank you Daniil for having that ever that was one of the best things Fayetteville had going for it um so I rented that studio from Daniil, and uh, there were a lot of great bands in that in the in the Quonset Hut at that time. Uh, Pumpkinhead was just about over, but they still rented the studio. Ultra Suede was renting from them. A couple of the Horn guys from Digby O'Hara uh, showed up while Shane and I were being loud doing our thing over there. Uh, a couple of the Horn guys and the drummer Nate Higgins and Jacob Humphreys and uh, Drew, I do not remember his last name, I apologize, played sax. But those three guys came over and, uh, and, we, and it, felt like, it felt like on that night, you know, there could be a band. And, and soon, through the course of time, uh, Shane's, uh, Shane's friend, Lonnie Wheeler, excellent bass player, 
uh, joined us, and we uh, we had a you know we had a world tour of Dixon Street where we bounced back and forth from Chester's to Georgia's to Georgia's to Chester's down to Layla's out to the Dart Room and you know back around. We played uh, we played Chester's uh, two Tuesday nights a month for a year. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and through the course of that, we got we got pretty good, and uh, and got to start playing some Friday and Saturday nights, and um, you know as as things happen, uh, one of our uh, one of our band members died, and we and it took us about a year to try and come to terms with that and get a new member, and but uh, Brian Dickinson. Uh, was the was the new guitarist and he brought a new fire and he was happy to book and you know got us back out there and uh and we did some things again for a while and um you know everything don't last forever and uh and that didn't either <laughs> uh but uh but here we are uh i did a uh, i was fortunate enough for uh some some other friends of mine uh, who had a band called the Bob Kramer Incident to uh, to tap me to be the uh, to help them on vocals? You know, Al they had an Allison Chains tribute, and uh, and of course the the harmony is really important. And uh, and Brian Parker, excellent vocalist and excellent musician all around. He can play more instruments than you have fingers on your hand, uh, and all of them better than you would think. Like surprising uh um he and i had a really good good type vocal harmony that uh that i think you know portrayed the band well we had a, we had some we had some good times and some good gigs we put maybe 400 people in georgia's one time um and uh you know and that and that ended uh because of uh the way um, so, you know, that was maybe 20, 2012, 2013. And then I didn't do anything till 2022. And I decided I can't, I, I can't sit on my hands until I'm 90. I'm going to try and do something. And, uh, so, so here I am back at it, back up to my old tricks, trying to, trying to go out in front of a crowd and have a good time winning them over. What sacrifices have you had to make? I've really chosen not to make any sacrifices for it. it it'll, it, it will happen around whatever else I can do. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to follow that. Uh, I didn't want to follow that. Uh, you know, my uncle's got a song, <laughs> you know, nobody else going to know these songs because there was this album on Ardent that, uh, he and Ricky and Sean made that never got released. But on that album is a song called the price of fan. And, uh, the line goes, the price of fame is always the same, takes at least 100%. And, uh, you know, I, I, I took it to heart. Like, you know, I do not want fame. I want to have fun playing music. That's a different thing. Uh, so I reckon I wasn't going to pay any price. I was just going to, you know, get out there and have my fun <laughs> as convenient to me, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, with an acoustic guitar at a keg party, uh, or, you know, backstage at Georgia's with 400 people having fun. <laughs> I'm curious to know where you rank your love for music. It's right there behind food and breathing. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's up there. Uh, like, I, I'm, I say I don't sacrifice anything for music because I'm going to, I'm going to entertain myself uh, being musical with myself no matter what uh, and um, and so it's always going to be present with me you know like like breathing or heartbeat it's it's there it's not going to not be there um, so it's yeah it'd be hard to overstate the importance <laughs> what lessons have you learned during your lifetime while you were pursuing music stay in the pocket there, there's timing for a reason and you're playing the silence as much as you're playing the notes and you've got to let the meter happen. 
I, you know, been <laughs> guys that have played with me know I've been guilty of jumping the gun to my next part, whether it's time or not, because I want to do my thing. Uh, and, uh, and I, and the biggest, you know, the biggest lesson I'd say that I've learned is that playing music is a, is a cooperative endeavor and you, and you are, and you are playing your silence for your bandmates music. you you know, it's, it's, it's got to work together to work right. Stay in the pocket is the biggest lesson I've learned. <laughs> what advice would you give to independent local artists that are maybe trying to decide like you have, where do they want to go? Do they want the fame or do they just want to play music and have fun? So fun or fame, what would you tell um, a upcoming musician and upcoming musician um, who is stuck at that fork in the road and trying to decide which way to go. There are different answers for different people. Um, you know, the, the person that, the person that wants fame is going to be, is going to be thirsty to do it because nobody can. Uh, they're going to want to, they're going to want to do it because it's tough or they wouldn't even want to try. They're, uh, you know, if, if, uh, like if you if you think you want it for fame, then you're not you don't have another priority. It's it's the only thing for you. And uh, and if it's not the only thing for you, don't pretend. Where do you see yourself in the next 10, 20 years? What's your legacy? What do you want to leave to us? What do you want us to know about you? Um, you know, I want to I want people to say that. Uh, world was a little better for me having run around in it. Uh, that I that that when that when I passed through your life, it was good for you. Uh, that that when you saw me on stage, it was good. That when you know you saw me in the parking lot, uh, I had something, I something useful for you. Something I could something I could help with. Uh, I want to I want to have been useful and make make things come together instead of fall apart. If people want to get in contact with you, how would they? Uh, my Instagram is gnu dot j e r e m i a h. Um, I can give you my phone number. Uh, <laughs> there ain't gonna be too many people that care. It'll be four seven nine two three six three six eight seven. If you want to book me, you can you can call me. I'll be glad to hear you.